Sup? Hey, you. And welcome. My name is Mike. And in this year old video, uh, what we're going to do today... Your name Mike? Nice to meet you, man. Hopefully, you know, because you're playing music, hopefully everything in here is safe for me to react to. That I can monetize. Is look at a marsh in California. And a few other things. This story takes us to a distant land, Yolo County, California. And this is certainly a uh, you only live once type story, unfortunately for some of the people today. Though I gotta say friends, the marsh we are talking about, he did not want to stop at what he was stopped at. Big fan of clowns, uh, was our guy, and uh, it turned out he was the biggest clown of all. He had certain ideas from when he was very young, none of them good. But are they ever? I, I don't exactly talk about, you know, good ideas on this channel. So to learn more, let's give it a go. If y'all want me to react to more of his videos... The city of Davis, California. Let me know that in the comment section below. But let me know uh, also, obviously, in the comments. And if I like in the video, if you want me to react to more of his videos, this is my first time reacting to his video. Yeah, it was named after a prominent farmer back in the day, the day being like 1850 something. What emerged from there was Davisville, then Davis, now Davis City, if you can believe that. Rub your eyes, honey, it's real. And by all accounts, it is a great place to live. It's a little over an hour's drive northeast of San Francisco, is home to about 70,000 people, and is ranked highly in nightlife, in family residence, education, and ranked lowly in crime. Let's add to that in this video. The city is dominated by the University of California, Davis, being the area's top employer, and is a top, with a capital T, school, especially for medicine of the human and animal kind. About 40,000 students enroll each semester, having a major impact on the town, and making Davis a hot ticket for you culture vultures out there. So take all of that, and then throw it out the window, because that's, that's not what uh, we're yapping about today, let me tell you. Things are gonna get chilly. 2013 is the year, if you can believe that, uh, when a teenager, a young fella, uh, he had had um, you know, since a young age, in his rather short life, he'd had an urge, a need, right? And not, not the need most uh, teenage lads have, mind you, uh, a different sort of need. Uh, a little bit murdering-y, a lot bit murdering-y, actually, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. For years, uh, at this point, he'd been uh, thinking about, pondering other synonyms for thinking about, he, he'd been solely consumed with his dream, which must have meant dreaming about murder. Oh God! For years, he's he was he was born a clucky, which which the parents of this mother clucker because that you don't just. All of a sudden, just get that urge. That comes from the bloodline. That comes from the family. That comes from generations after generations after generations after generations after generations after generations after generations. After generations. He started when he was a literal child. Yikes. And that's true. We'll get to it. Spring 2013 was when he said, screw it. I'm not, I'm not holding myself back anymore. I'm gonna like give in to, to my urge. I like an alcoholic who's done rationalizing and just picks up the bottle. That was their boy. But his dream was uh, murder of the serial kind. Wow. Oh my God. Why are you playing this? Why? 
Why? Sorry, it's been a long day. Why is he playing that family friendly kitty music? Talking about murderers! Hell no. Oliver Northup and Claudia Moppin marry relatives. There you go, there it is. They, they, they go to sources. They go to source. They go to problem of why this kid is the way he is. Because those two sons of glitches. Late in life. They were both in their 60s but were absolutely mad about each other and very happy to have finally found their love. They lived in a condo in South Davis, Oliver, Chip. He'd been a Navy man in WW2 and was now an attorney, still cracking the metaphorical whip at age 87 and grateful to do so. And Chip and Claudia, they weren't happy to do their thing, stick to themselves, no sir. They were both heavily involved in their local clubs and their Unitarian church. Claudia was 76 years old. She was retired, but retired from earning income, not from being an active person who delighted in being surrounded by all these fresh-faced college students and was eager to hear their stories, ideas, and attend their events. They both had kids from previous marriages, bit late to have them together, and so their rather large, extended, blended family were close, and the living was good in Davis, C.A. Un uh, until it wasn't. See that Unitarian uh, church? Chip was actually one of the founding members of it. Uh, on the morning of the 14th of April, 2013, um, you know, they were founding members, they were always, uh, helping run it. Uh, well, well, people noticed, essentially, when they didn't show up on the morning of the 14th of April, 2013, and, as I, they would have always been there. Calls to their home and their mobile phones went to voicemail. Chip was to play with his folk band later that day, and was also nowhere to be seen. They had family, kids not too far away, who decided to pop over, have a gander, and knock knock knocking to no answer. Then, uh, a cheeky little <laughs> pop around the back of the house led to the discovery of an open window with a slashed screen. Jesus. The window was in the bedroom, and the room was dark, but not dark enough to hide the horror that was on the bed. The police were called. Chip and Claudia were both laying on the bed in their home. They had both been stabbed to death God. over 50 times. Holy shit. shit. Holy shit. I'm sorry, but like, to, to, oh my God, to stab, oh my God, that's overkill, that's OD, that's ridiculous, that's a psychopath. So, they'd also been mutilated with a mobile phone being placed inside Claudia's stomach oh. and a glass inside chips. It was extremely gruesome. They had been a while dying. The investigation that followed was, um, was not, not gonna like it, was not off to a great start. As the police started cordoning off the place, you know, started going through the stuff, looking for forensics and, well, everything, they started to notice around the house uh, things they didn't expect and couldn't find things they did. For example, the house was not torn apart. Nothing was stolen, and the couple, they, they had valuables lying around. No missing wallet, no missing purse, and no one had been looking for that stuff either. No robbery. And to go along with that, no evidence. No fingerprints. And in the bloody scene, no footprints either. No traces on the... Which lets me know that they knew exactly what they were doing. 
and it was personal. Those, anyway, there were no forensics left behind whatsoever. And even in the subsequent days and weeks when the FBI was called in, there was no trace of the killer. Family members, neighbors, churchgoers, business associates, the whole kit and caboodle all interviewed and let go. And this case would go cold, <laughs> as hard as that is to believe, uh, as time would go by. The, uh, the police had literally nothing to go on as to who could have done this. But... And it was a horrific, brutal, double murder. Two elderly, lovely, kind people murdered in their own home for seemingly no reason whatsoever. But... As I said, the usual, family, nothing there, bit of, no, the will, where there's a will, there's a way, not today. It grabbed the city by the shoulders and shook the shit out of it. But still, the investigators were no closer to finding who was behind it and stopping them before they struck again. But, and this is a big booty, the police, they had no, uh, no clue, but a certain circle of friends in Davis High School they knew about it all. They knew who had done it, uh, because he had told them. And by told, I mean bragged. The police would only, uh, find out in June, two months after the murders originally took place, when this call was made. Okay, next place, emergency. Uh, can this be anonymous? What are you reporting? Sure. Did you do it, Cluck? Daniel Marsh wasn't, uh, he wasn't like unheard of, uh, like around town, uh, but, but not in the way you're thinking, right? He was a goddamn hero. Uh, all of a sudden he passed out and sort of flew back into his seat. I grabbed onto the steering wheel and uh, directed it off to the side of the road, uh, started pounding on his chest, and after about 30 seconds he came back. In 2008, when he was 10 years old, Daniel Marsh was born in 1997, he received an American Red Cross Heroes Award. He managed to save his father's life, resuscitate him, after his dad had a heart attack. Fair play to you. I don't know bringing someone back to life, uh, I mean, kinda. He did a CPR. Um, either he liked it so much, or he hated it so much, because he decided and became obsessed with doing the opposite. Shortly after that uh, hero moment, his parents divorced. His mother was having an affair. That was an extremely unpleasant series of events for him. So much so that he began to fantasize about murdering someone. Specifically at the time, he wanted to murder his kindergarten teacher. Wow. His mother had left his dad for her. From the age of 11, he began pretty much continuous- From the age of, oh my God. <laughs> counseling for depression, anger issues, suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts, and anorexia. He was bullied in school as he was a small guy, so that didn't help. He would live with his mother after his dad kicked him out at 14 for coming home. Yo, bullying somebody that's already gone through shit outside of school is probably the worst thing you could do to somebody. Drunk and high one day, his mother never noticed anything off about him. But he was into, like, sick shit. He would spend all day, uh, just watching murder videos. On, like, literal, actual people getting their head chopped off. Jesus. You know, those type of videos. Yeah, uh, and he became obsessed with serial killers. Yeah. What a weird... But he wasn't just interested in, like, learning about them. Uh, he wanted to fucking be one of them. Like, literally was gonna fucking try his hardest to be one of them, you know? This is the kind of person where we would say, please don't. Follow your dreams. It's unrealistic. Your <laughs> dream is dead. He thought the opposite, or at least he wanted a participation award. 
He began to talk all the time about murder, torture, drawing pictures of his fantasies. He dreamt about it, about killing and brutally murdering. Oh my god! See, 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 see. When y'all see stuff like this, don't just pass by, please. Don't just scroll by. Don't just talk past it. Don't just walk by. Show a police officer. Show somebody that's going to do something about it. Or you do something about it. <laughs> this is not funny at all. But Spongebob. Leah, 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 Leah. Woo. Leah, Leah. Y'all remember that episode? <laughs> Got older, the dreams became more and more regular and more and more intense. It was all he could think about and he didn't want it to stop. Animal cruelty, dead giveaway? That popped up, he murdered a cat, he strangled a cat to death, saying he did it just because he could. His girlfriend, he started to get more and more violent with her, constantly pushing the envelope. He also loved clowns, uh, like, big. This nigga. Clowns. You got me there. You, I'm going to go ahead and cut off the video now. You got me at clowns. You got me at clowns. You got me. Clowns, my nigga? I don't know. Especially the fucking creepy ones. Uh, unfortunately, I guess he had no mirrors in his house. In January 2013, he saw the school counselor due to his ideations, and he, he was on a shitload of medication as well. Come on. He talked about his homicidal urges, about uh, torturing people, about how he had these urges, and he'd just given up trying to push it to the back of his head. He'd given up on. He was just gonna let it let it take over. He said it. Through. The counselor called the cops, the therapist, but nothing happened. Wow. And then, on the 14th of April, uh... No wow, nothing happened? Oh. My. God. Nothing happened. I bet you something happened when something happened. Marsh decided to tell some of his close friends a story. A story about what he had done the night before. At first they were shocked, and they didn't believe him. And he was telling this story about what he had done with a big shame grin on his face. See, the couple lived two doors from his dad and within walking distance of his mom, and he didn't hold back on the details. He said what he had done was the best experience of his entire life. He said it was better than busting a nut. Now, I hear you barking big dog. Why didn't his close friends and his girlfriend, you know, immediately go to the police when he said this? Well, firstly, they were scared, as you can imagine. And secondly, he had like this hold over his friends. Uh, they were described as having an unusual level of closeness. And it seems like he was just very adept at manipulating those closest to him anyway. They attended counseling many times together. And when separated, his girlfriend would ask to leave so she could speak to Daniel before answering any questions. Weird. After the murders, Daniel was a top student before he was quiet, he didn't speak to others or teachers, often late. In May 2015, he was student of the month. Look at you, wow, it turns out just brutally murdering people kicked him into shape. Or more likely he was just overcompensating so people wouldn't suspect him. But he couldn't overcompensate for long, you know, making himself look like a grade A student, because that same month, May 2013, he was kicked out of school for carrying a knife. Daniel, uh, just to know like, just, like a little bit about him, he would later score a 35 out of 40. That's an A. Um, on a psychopathy checklist. Not the time when you want a good grade. That's when we just run through. It's 20 items, right? On, on each item, you can score a 0, a 1, or a 2. So if Dan Marsh got a 35, he got a lot of 2s. The max. The kind of things it would say about you would be superficial charm. We, we see that a lot in serial killers. Grandiose self-worth. You get a zero, a one, or a two on that. 
pathological lying, prone to boredom, manipulative, lack of guilt, parasitic lifestyle, promiscuous sexual behavior, lack of long-term goals, many short-term marriages, failure to accept responsibility. That's quite what's 20. It's pretty interesting. And so when Dan was like diagnosed with that by a, a psychiatrist or whatever, um, well, Daniel Marsh just like knocked it out of the park. So it's no surprising he did what he did and was planning on doing it again when his friends uh, finally reported it to the police two months later. The reason they reported it was that Dan's girlfriend broke up with him out of fear. After she broke up with him in June, he broke into her house in the middle of the night. Uh, scary shit from a guy who just told you he brutally murdered two people. She then told a friend who told the cops. The friend was interviewed and knew everything about the murders. He had heard it all from Daniel, and so the police took him seriously. Well, he talked about killing people a lot. I didn't really take it seriously about, well, killed someone. He kept buzzing them open. It's just to see the insides or something. And then uh, he went to the woman, I think, and he, uh, he wanted to know how an eye looked like. So he tried taking it out with a knife, but he said it was really hard, so he couldn't do it. Why did it take you until now to speak to us? Because, I don't know, actually. I was afraid. It was on the 17th of June that the police took Daniel in. They spoke, and he briefly, um, he briefly denied it, was sobbing. Mm. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. Hi. It must be Daniel? Yeah. Yeah. Chris. Yeah. Nice to meet you. What do you know, Dan? I just know that somebody broke into this old couple's house and stabbed them, killed them. Uh -huh. That one little kid, that, you know, there's always that one outcast. Dad. And mom split when you were pretty young. Yeah. Wow. And then mom basically left, abandoned you or your family. Yeah, for like three or four months. I used to like harm myself. Kind of see this car too there, yeah. Yeah. I don't hurt people. But why are you running my life? Why should I? I'm not running your life. I'm trying to solve a homicide, a double homicide. And if you do it, I understand, and I am there for you to try to make other people understand, because I see it. I need help. Okay. That's the first step. But not for long. Uh, after about three hours, the police played a recording of his friends telling him he had done it, and he was done denying. Why the heck would you just sit here and fall face lie to Aaron with me? I am... You guys are threatening me with... <laughs> what? The truth? Getting arrested for two murders. I am so scared right now. Of course, I'm going to do anything I can to try and say that I didn't do this. If you want to help me, then don't ruin my life. Anything, send me to the psychiatric hospital. Every time I look at someone, in my mind, I see flashes of images of me killing them. And I never thought about and plotted about killing the woman that my mother left my father. What was your plan? I was going to slow through. When was the first time you started thinking about killing these people down the street? I didn't. Did you start thinking about it? That night, I just... I couldn't take it anymore. I had to do it. I lost control. That night, uh, Dan had decided to kill. And kill he did. He left his mother's house on the 14th of April between 2 and 3 a.m. He had a 6-inch knife with him, and he was looking for any open window or door he could find. He found it in the home of Claudia and Chip. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He was surprised that two people were here. He walked into their living room and sat down till he heard snoring, and then he walked into their bedroom. He stood and waited beside their bed. He was deciding how he would kill them. Claudia, she woke up at one point, saw him, and screamed. He began stabbing her. Then Chip woke, and he stabbed him to death, too. He then disemboweled them, 
pulled out what, what shouldn't be pulled out. He cut open various parts of them, and he stuffed items inside them simply to mess with the investigation. I got a hole on the screen, climbed in through the back, went to their bedroom, opened the door, and I just kind of stood over their bed watching them sleep for a few minutes. My body was trembling. I was nervous, but excited and exhilarated. I was actually going to do it. I was there. It was finally happening. I opened both of their torsos around here, and in the moment I put a phone inside of her, and I put a cup inside the guy. The reason they found no evidence is Dan had planned this out methodically. He wore gloves, a ski cap, taped the bottoms of his shoes to avoid leaving any identification. I'm not gonna lie, it felt amazing. The most exhilarating, enjoyable feeling I've ever felt. It was pure happiness and adrenaline. He said dopamine, just all of it were rushing over me. You um, mentioned that pretty much everybody you meet, you have thoughts about how you would kill them. Yeah. Oh, how would you kill me? Oh my god. There's a lot of ways. Um, choking you to death with your tie. Okay. Uh, beating your face into the mirror until it broke and using the glass to cut your arteries. Uh, gouging your eyes out and just smashing your face into the wall. Okay. Nothing personal. Did you ever look up? I'm not going to do research on psychopaths. Yeah. Why did you do that? I looked up sociopaths and psychopaths because I always found it fascinating and the more I've aged, the more I can relate because I don't feel so for the people at all. I don't feel empathy for them. And whether I like that or not, it's just like I want to hurt people. I want to kill people, but I don't want to want that. I wish it wasn't that way. In the days after he killed Claudia and Ship, he went out again. He was wandering the streets of Davis with a baseball bat. He got it. He needs to be in solitary confinement or lethal. Because he can't see nobody at all. He he the second he sees somebody is is rats. Oh ah. Looking for anyone he could find to beat them to death. He wanted to use a baseball bat so the police wouldn't link it. He didn't want to stab someone to death again. Thankfully he did not find anyone. He hid the clothing he wore at his house, and the police later found the bloody items. Daniel Marsh was charged with the two murders. Well, police found the murdered couple stabbed to death inside this home, their home right here in mid-April. Now, two months later, just two doors down, the FBI and Davis police were inside that home right there, collecting pieces of evidence for a case against a 16-year-old. And right now we're getting our first look at the 16-year-old accused of murdering an elderly couple in Davis. Prosecutors say the man there with the tie, Daniel Marsh, hid in the couple's home, waiting for them and then torturing them in their final hours. Well, the courtroom was packed. There wasn't an empty seat in there. Sheriff's deputies actually brought Daniel Marsh in through a side entrance to the courthouse, a blocked entrance, and put a jacket over his head to hide him as he was brought in. He was kept separate from all of the other inmates, mostly because they're all adults. And even though he's being tried as an adult, he's still a juvenile, so he was kept at a distance from most everybody else in the courtroom. 16-year-old Daniel Marsh stood before the... He's looking at, I bet you, he's looking at all these people, figuring out how he's going to clock them up. Or through a side doorway, shielded from view of the public, including his father and friends who were in court. Marsh provided one-word answers as he waived his right to a preliminary hearing within 10 days. The judge denied him bail and relatives of the victims could be heard whispering yes in agreement. Friends of Marsh said they saw him in the days before his arrest and had a hard time believing he could be responsible. He did have a lot of joy in his life and personally... Joy in his life? Yeah, joy. That joy came from... from... 
watching people die, watching people get clucked up horrifically. He got joy out of out of seeing blood, broken bones, die. What are you talking about? How are you hitting? Oh my God. Oh God, what are you talking about? Um, I couldn't ever see him doing what he's been accused of. <laughs> um, just from the side that I've seen from that's, him. That's Prosecutors cat. have not revealed the motive behind the double murder or any relationship between Marsh and the couple. Marsh's father did live near the couple until recently putting his home on the market. He initially pleaded not guilty. Later, not guilty by reason of insanity. In September 2014, he went on trial. In court, Marsh glanced back at his friends and family before the start of today's preliminary hearing. Davis police officer Mark Herman looked at photos from the crime scene as he described how the couple was found lying in their bed, each stabbed more than 60 times. A deputy coroner said the bodies had been cut open, their internal organs pulled out. He was 17 years old then and tried as an adult. This would become a thing later. The defense was, well, all the medication he was on. That made him go crazy. That didn't work, and he was found guilty. He was found guilty, and he was found to be sane. The sentencing, though, was, uh, well, even though he was tried as an adult, he wasn't, at least not when he committed the murders, so he could not receive either the death penalty or life without parole. So he got life in prison with parole after 52 years. Long enough, uh, I'd say. Jurors rejected the defense argument that Marsh was suffering from the side effects of antidepressant medication. In fact, jurors agreed to four special circumstances, including that Marsh was lying in wait for his victims and that he tortured them. But due to California law, he got parole after 25, which is 17 years from now. He'll still be young enough to do a lot more killing. Oh my god! Later, there was a big old hullabaloo due to him being charged in an adult court, various California law changes which led to his defense, you know, filing many, many appeals to try and get his conviction reversed. But ultimately, it was finally decided in late 2021 that he will be serving his whole sentence. His whole sentence being parole after 25. But, oh, okay, wow. having said all of that, I think it's unlikely that Daniel Marsh will get parole. Um, due to him being extremely homicidal, so... In conclusion, the seriousness of the offense, both in terms of its sophistication and the gravity, along with the finding that Marsh has made little progress in rehabilitation in the past five years, support the ultimate ruling in this court to transfer the case to adult criminal court. There is a preponderance of evidence to support this order. The criminal judgment in case CRF 13-2418 is hereby reinstated. The defendant is remanded to state prison, CDCR, to serve the balance of an indeterminate life sentence with a minimum of 52 years. It is so ordered. It's not Samuel Marsh, uh, one sick puppy. He dreamt about murdering since he was a boy, and when he finally did it, it was as, as horrible as possible. And then he wanted to do it again. He's someone who's just straight up, like nothing, there's nothing else there other than a psycho, like, like Cody Legevikoff again, right? There's, there's nothing that like, have said about his parents divorced, but hey, a lot of people's parents divorced. They don't dream about murdering someone brutally and then do it to two people as they are sleeping. As I said, I'd be very surprised if he actually ever did get parole. Um, I can't imagine his suicide, or his homicidal uh, thoughts will just, you know, vanish away. Doesn't seem like someone who will ever change. Mad for the murder. He also gave a TED talk. Wow. Hurt people, hurt people. I came to realize that there are no such things as evil people in this world. Only damaged people embrace our humanity. Uh, unfortunately, it's not on the internet anymore. This is after the family of Claudia and Ship, well, they were appalled that he was able to give a TED talk. Um, and in that TED talk, it seems he just moaned about how he deserved a second chance. Unfortunately, Ship and Claudia won't get one. I don't feel sorry for the people. Hey, we can all say the same for you, Dan. I'm saying it. He should have got life. What the f Thank you so much for watching. Uh, 
I uh, really appreciate you um, getting to this point, which is the end of the video. Uh, so if you did, thank you. Uh, really, if you stuck with me for this long, hey, can't thank you enough. It means a lot. All right, here, go on. I'll see you guys uh, real soon in the next old video, which will probably be in like a couple of days. So look forward to that. And until then, please just, you know, um, take care of yourselves. As always, you know, just yourselves, each other, those around you, because I love you. Um, thank you. My gift. I hope I can, uh, you know, I hope this video is safe for me to put up. It talked about a lot of murders. Step, like, it talked about a lot of stuff. Um, but that was the chapter. I think he should have got life in prison. You know, that's ridiculous. I feel like the laws in all states should be the same, regardless of where you at in America. Oh my God! Ain't why did he? Ain't why did why? He should be in solitary confinement. It, yeah, in solitary, cause he can't even. He can't even be in regular jail or prison with anybody. He cannot socialize with anybody. And it was only a matter of time before he clucked up his friends. And what the hell was he talking? What, what the hell was his friend talking about when he was like, I can't even see him doing something. That, that's cat. That's cat. Get the hell out of there. If you want me to react to more of his videos, let me know that in the comment section below. Keep it cool. Keep it classy. And I love you. Stay happy. My family.